Georgiana and hello to those of you watching on live stream this morning. Would you stand to your feet? Let's worship the God of all creation. Come on, let's sing. Yeah. 
house of God and for those of you joining on virtual church so glad that you are tuned in with us why don't you take 90 seconds text somebody that's going through a hard time just let them know that you are thinking of them and praying for them and if you're here in the room find somebody new and say hello Well, good morning. Good morning. Am I on? Good morning, Georgiana. Man, it is a full house in here this morning. That's super exciting. Uh, if you have any seats, will you uh, try to close that gap and just get real close to somebody that's probably a stranger? Make it real nice and awkward. Um, 
If you're in, the, in these two middle sections, scoot towards the middle aisle and free up the seats on the outside here. If you are all the way on the outside, maybe scoot towards the wall and just free up some seats that are uh, closer to the aisle. So I don't see anybody moving at all. I just gave perfect instructions. So if you are in this section here, move towards this aisle, this section, move towards this aisle and fill in the empty seats towards the wall, go towards the wall. We have two here. We have almost a whole row right up here, the second row here. All right. We knew it would be busy. We are getting close to back to school. All the kids are really excited about that. I know. Yeah. The parents. The parents are really excited about that. All right. Well, as we get settled in, welcome. We are so glad that you are here. My name is Ryan. I'm one of the pastors here, and it is just a pleasure to, uh, to serve at this church and to, to just join you in worship today. Um, I have a few things that I just want to uh, make sure that you all are aware of. We are kind of uh, transitioning to a new season. It doesn't feel any different outside. It still feels terribly hot, uh, but we are transitioning to uh, what feels like fall in kind of the, the school rhythm of the year, at least. So uh, there's a few different things going on. And so as we kind of wrap up a summer, uh, we want to make sure that we acknowledge some of the awesome things that we did this summer. You, you all heard about youth camp and VBS and a number of great things. We also want to acknowledge uh, backyard missions. So so if you volunteered for Backyard Missions this summer, will you stand, please? I'm going to embarrass you. Go ahead. Here we go. Thanks, Kalina. You're the first one. Thank you. Go ahead and stand. Yeah. So in case you're not aware, Backyard Missions is a great partnership between us and First Baptist Church up the road. They run an organization called House of Hope, and we take uh, a few different Mondays during the summer, and we go and we are on location there helping them out. And so Backyard Missions is, is a great thing, um, and we had some awesome volunteers. So uh, once again, as we kind of roll over into what the fall schedule might look like, uh, we want to let you know there's a number of things that are going to happen uh, as we get into August, September, October. And I'm going to throw a whole lot at you here all at once right now. So here's what you need to do. A number of these are just kind of FYI sort of teaser things. So you don't need all the details, but if something kind of strikes you, just kind of make a note of that, and we'll come back to a lot of these things. But here's the full schedule as we get into uh, the fall. So go ahead, Jen. In August, we have our M2M small groups that are going to start back up again. That's our men's ministry, ministry to men, rather. Uh, those are going to start back up again. We also have Children's Hunger Project, our weekly meal packing. It's going to start back up actually this week. We'll talk about that more here in just a second. We also have Vineyard Bible Study. It's going to start back up in August. Vineyard Bible Study is, is a great chance to just go deep, deep in Scripture. Happens right here in this room on Wednesdays. There's a soup dinner before that, and there's prayer in the chapel before that. So that all that happens in August. What's in September, Jen? In September, we have a women's Bible study starting back up. We will also have Grief Share. It's kind of a, a Monday, a weekly meeting for those who are uh, going through some, uh, just some tough times with the lost loved ones. Grief Share starting, starting back up on Mondays. Uh, we also have a loss of a spouse event kind of in conjunction with Grief Share. It's a one-time event uh, that's going to be happening. We have Financial Peace University. It's going to be the first time here for Georgiana. More information about that to come here in just a second. And then we also have Pie Auction at the end of September, which is always a fantastic time. Uh, and so those are some things happening in September. And then one more, let's go to October. In October, we have an M2M breakfast happening, and we also have the pumpkin patch going to happen in October. So we are gearing up for a really, really full fall schedule, loads of opportunities, tons of fun. And uh, like I said, if any of those little things just kind of struck you, just make a note of that. If you can't wait for more details, send us an email this week, and we'll get d details to you. Uh, but all that stuff will be coming either via announcements or our Hook weekly email, and you'll have more details about that. So a couple things I want to talk about specifically, because they're, they're coming up really soon. Uh, Children's Hunger Project actually starts, the meal packing starts this coming Wednesday, August 9th, this coming Wednesday. So if you want to get involved in that, what that looks like is day, or excuse me, during the day on Wednesdays, uh, people sign up for like one hour time slots to help with Children's Hunger, Hunger Project meal packing. And so if you would like to sign up for that, uh, you don't have to do it every week necessarily, but signing up for one hour slots on Wednesdays, that would be great. Scan the QR code, go to the connections page, you can find more information about that. And then one more thing, it's not like right around the corner, but it is brand new for us this year. Financial Peace University is going to be starting in September. Here is a quick teaser video about what that is about. Go ahead, Jen.
So once again, that is uh, new for us this fall. Uh, Signups are coming, but for right now, we just want you to be aware. So just a little bit of a teaser video, be aware. It's going to start September 11th and run through several Mondays uh, this fall. And so again, just an awareness sort of thing. Uh, Also, we have um, our Cambridge Volunteer Ministry is restarting again uh, this year. And so that is us really being plugged in at our school over in Cocoa Cambridge Elementary. So we want you to be aware of that. If you know exactly what that entails, you're welcome to go ahead and scan the QR code or whatever and register now. If you have questions about what that is like, uh, Pastor Chris, our missions pastor, is going to be out in the courtyard. And here is a really, really special thing. Not only is Pastor Chris out there, but she has arranged it so that the assistant principal of Cambridge is here on location today. Is she in the room by any chance? Evelyn's. Co- oh, Evelyn, hey, will you stand up? I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. Let me just apologize now. So this is Evelyn Zicardi. Yeah. This is Evelyn Zagardi. She's already mad at me for making her stand up. But if you have any questions, I'm sure Pastor Chris or Evelyn, I'm sure, can answer any questions about what it means to volunteer at Cambridge. And so uh, this is a great opportunity for you all. Uh, and then lastly, today is Communion Sunday. We have communion once a month here. And if you're not familiar, what we do every single month is we will tithe. We will give 10% of whatever comes in on Communion Sundays, and we will send that out to an organization that we believe in. Now, what we're going to support this coming Sunday, or this this coming, this actual Sunday, what we're going to support this Sunday is an organization called Who We Play For. And you see their mission right behind me. It is to eliminate preventable sudden cardiac death in youth uh, and the young through affordable heart screenings. And so uh, if you've watched the news in the past couple of weeks, this is exactly what happened to LeBron James' son, Bronny James, uh, who's kind of had a sudden cardiac event. He's in stable condition now. But these are the things that seem to kind of creep up on certain youth, uh, certain young athletes. And so they're trying to, um, what's that? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they're trying to prevent, I thought you had an update. Do you, do you know, Bronny? Um, so they're trying to prevent this sort of thing from happening and really get ahead of, ahead of it in, uh, in this community. And so this is who we're supporting, who we play for through our communion offering. So all that being said, again, I threw a whole lot out at you. Thank you all for being patient. Uh, I want to invite Bob Price to come and lead us in prayer this morning. And as we do, I want to invite you to, uh, to have just in mind as you pray, uh, there are 600 Cambridge backpacks in our chapel right now. They're ready. Yeah. They are ready to go out to support every single student at Cambridge Elementary. They're going to go out on Tuesday and be delivered to Cambridge. And so as we enter this time of prayer with Bob leading us, will you uh, specifically pray God's blessing over those backpacks this morning? Thank you, Bob. I've never gone up this side. Oh, yeah, it works great. Yeah. (laughs) It's not bad. Morning, church. Let's bow our heads and pray. Father, you are the rock on which we stand and our salvation. We thank you for the grace that you have shown us in Christ Jesus, our Lord. We confess our sins and acknowledge that we cannot stand before you on our own merits. Forgive us for our sins and forgive us for devoting much of our time, so much of our time and energy to the things of this world. Lord, it is written that we will see trouble in this life and that we will face suffering. Give us the wisdom to understand that in order to be conformed to the image of Jesus, We must also learn obedience through the things we suffer. Father, we ask that through your spirit, you would keep our focus on Jesus and give us confidence because you have blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Jesus. Therefore, may we rest in the assurance that no temporary suffering in this life can compare with our blessing in Jesus, which are eternal. Father, we thank you for each and every person who gave their time and money to provide backpacks for the children of Cambridge. Father, we ask that every child that receives a backpack recognizes that it is a gift from Jesus and that he loves them with a love that is beyond understanding. Father, we thank you for Pastor Janice and her love for this congregation, and we ask that you would fill her with your spirit and speak powerfully through her this morning so that our hope will be set on the grace that will be brought to us at the revelation of Jesus. It is in his name we pray. Amen. Amen, church. Would you stand back to your feet this morning as we continue in worship, knowing that the heavens declare the glory of God and we get to join in with all creation in singing his praise. We 
are good, that you are gracious, that you are loving, that you are kind. And so it is a joy to follow you. It is a joy to follow you knowing that you are leading us into greener pastures, leading us beside still waters, leading us into more abundant life, leading us into a kingdom to come. So God, it is a joy to follow you. And even in the tough circumstances, even in the difficulties, even in the struggles and the suffering, God, keep our eyes on the fact that you are good. Knowing that one day we will fully see that you are more glorious, more beautiful, more majestic, more generous and kind than we ever could have possibly imagined. Lord, would you keep our eyes on you and let us taste and see that you are good. As we open your word this morning and as Pastor Janice speaks to us and over us, Lord, let us see your goodness and your kindness. It's in the mighty name of Jesus we pray and all God's children say, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Well, good morning, church. Um, as um, Nick said, I'm, I'm Jana Shepherd. I'm the Congregational Care Pastor here at Georgiana Church, and it is so, so, so good to be in worship with you this morning. And we do have a full house. This is really awesome. Um, I want to thank Pastor Corky for trusting me with his pulpit while he is away, and I want to thank Pastor Ryan for um, winging with me all morning long. Um, I also want, Pastor Corky wanted me to share with you that he will be back in the office on um, Tuesday of this week, at which time he'll begin um, responding to your emails if you sent him one, and also responding to your appointment request if you had one. So um, that will be on Tuesday. Um, so if you were here last week, did you know that Pastor Ryan launched us into a new sermon series last week called Things Jesus Never Said? Things Jesus Never Said. And if you weren't here last week, then you want to make sure and go on to our podcast and take a listen because Pastor Ryan had an amazing word for us last week, and I know that you will be blessed by it. Now, one of the things he said when he introduced us to this series was he said, this series is not aimed at condemning anyone, right? It's not aimed at condemning anyone. We've all been guilty at one time or another of taking a common everyday words that we hear and attributing them to Scripture. But here's the thing, church. There is a real danger in doing this. There's a real danger in doing this. The Apostle Paul, while chained to a prison wall for the sake of the gospel, writes to his protege, Timothy. Concerned about the welfare of the churches during a time of great persecution, Paul admonishes Timothy to guard the gospel. To guard the gospel. And he says this, he says, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth, who correctly handles the word of truth. And you see, church, this is not just an admonishment for Timothy, but for all of us, because nothing could be of greater importance than for us to be a church for us to be a people who correctly handle the word of truth. Now, as your congregational care pastor, one of the things that I have often heard people say to me many, many times, maybe you have said this, um, in the time of trial or hardship or suffering, people often say to me, I know God must be trying to teach me something. I know God must be trying to teach me something. And sometimes I respond by asking them, on what scripture do you base this assumption? Now, to be sure, there are some scriptures that they could cite, which may serve in some way to support this belief. But so far, no one has answered by reciting one. Instead, they say something like this. Well, it's just what I have to believe in order to cope with what I'm going through. Now, this always makes me wonder. What if they never figure out what it is that God's trying to teach them? Does it still help them cope? Or does it simply leave them feel, feeling more confused, judged, and abandoned by God? And church, this is really how we want to live our lives, by grasping hold of whatever makes sense to us in order to help us make sense of life. Now, the, sadly, this is a rather of a cultural phenomenon right now and one of the reasons for this serving series. But wouldn't it make much more sense for us to grasp hold of 
whatever is true in order to help us make sense of life? Because for sure, the truth is far superior than whatever little sayings that we are holding on to. Now, Scripture has much to say about hardships and trials and sufferings that we endure. And the Bible is full of stories about people who have endured them. So I want to dig in this morning and see if we can find some real truth to cling to when trouble comes our way. And I want to start by taking a look at what Scripture has to say about the source or the origin of hardships and suffering. And we don't have to look too far, but we find it right there in the third chapter of Genesis. And we all know this story well, but the very condensed version of it is this. The cunning serpent deceives Eve into doubting God's word by asking, did God really say? This question and its response changed the course of human history. Eve's doubt leads her to sin and Adam along with her. And now the garden wants a place of joy and fellowship with God becomes a place of fear and hiding from God. And with the origin of sin comes the origin of um, suffering, okay? God's judgment. Eve's judgment fell on what was most uniquely hers as a woman that she would have pains during childbearing. Yet as a sign of God's grace, even in the midst of judgment, through childbearing, the human race would continue on. Adam's judgment came in the form of hard work and painful toil, something that we all know much about, right? God said to him, through the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the dust of the ground, since from it you were taken For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Though Adam would have to work long and hard, he would be able to produce food that would sustain them. Once again, God's grace, even in the midst of judgment. Yet Adam's toil would not be able to stave off death. Eventually, the body would fail, and Adam would return to dust from which he was taken. And that judgment was passed on to all who are born of Adam, which is every one of us and all of mankind. See, the serpent set out to alienate people from God, and that he did. Sin separates us from God, and the penalty for that sin is death. The Apostle Paul reminds us of this in his letter to the Romans. He said, sin entered the world through one man, and death entered the world through sin. But Paul doesn't leave it just at that. He goes on to remind us of this great hope that we now have in Christ Jesus. He goes on and he says, Consequently, just as one trespass resulted in condemnation for all people, so also one righteous act resulted in justification and life for all people. For just as through the disobedience of one man, which we just said was Adam, Many were made sinners through the obedience of the one man, Christ. Many will be made righteous. You see, just as God's judgment fell on all people, so to his grace through the redemption of sins in Christ Jesus is freely offered to all people. See, scripture is clear that hardships and suffering have their root in sin and God's subsequent judgment on it. And as Christians, we are not exempt from it. In fact, we are promised them. For what Jesus really did say is this, in this world, you will have trouble. You will have trouble. See, trials and hardships are inevitable on this side of heaven. Every day we're reminded of the fact that we are fallen beings living in a fallen world of broken air conditioners, mole crickets, dementia, cancer, other people's sins, and the daily burden of our own remaining sin. And couple that with the fact that we have an enemy roaming around like a roaring lion who is bent on our destruction. Trials and trouble will come our way. 
overwhelming at best and debilitating at worst. Hardships and suffering are exactly what we all hope to avoid, but not one of us will. But church, just after Jesus said that we will have trouble, he said, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And he prefaced that by saying, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In him, church, and only in him may we have peace. So here's what we know so far from Scripture, not something that we just thought sounded good, but something we pulled right out of Scripture, is that hardships have their origin in the fall of mankind and that we are assured we will encounter them, right? But we're also assured by the words of Jesus himself that even through them, we can have peace because he has overcome the world. But the question before us this morning is this. Are the hardships I'm facing God's way of trying to teach me something? Are the hardships I'm facing God's way of trying to teach me something? Well, you see, Jesus did not say, in this life you will have trouble because God needs to teach you something. And what we've already shown from Scripture is that hardships have their root in the fact that we live in a broken, fallen world where moth and rust destroy where bodies fail, where people sin, and an enemy roams. You see, church, God did not cause the brokenness that brings suffering. God did not cause the brokenness that brings suffering. But in his grace, he can still teach us through them. But we should be careful not to reduce suffering to a lesson to be learned. You see, God's ways and his purposes are so much higher than that. Consider Joseph, whose jealous brothers threw him into a cistern, and then they sold him into slavery. And while he was a bought servant in the household of one of Pharaoh's officials, Potiphar's wife falsely accuses Joseph of assaulting her, and he's thrown into prison. Now, eventually, because of Joseph's God-given gift to interpret dreams, Pharaoh elevates him to be in charge of the entire land of Egypt. And during the seven years of famine that Joseph had predicted during one of his dreams, Joseph's guilty brothers traveled to Egypt in order to seek um, to buy grain during the famine. So now Joseph has been appointed governor over all of Egypt, And he's the one to whom his guilty brothers will need to appear in order to make this purchase. But you see, Joseph does not condemn his brothers, but he welcomes them, saying this, Do not be distressed, and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here, because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land, and for the next five years there will be no plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. And without the saving of Joseph's family, we would not get Jesus. Because Jesus is born of the line of one of Joseph's brothers, Judah, right? See, God was not trying to teach Joseph some kind of lesson through all the years of suffering he endured. His purposes were much higher than that. But God did use Joseph's suffering to deliver the nation of Israel from famine and certain death. And consider Christ himself, who endured the greatest suffering in human history, rejected by his own people, betrayed by his closest friends, mocked, scorned, flogged, and crucified for sins he did not commit. Yet the purpose for Christ's suffering was certainly not to be taught a lesson, but to bring sinners back to God and to redeem all of humanity. So church, instead of settling on, at best, the half-truth that God must be trying to teach you something in your suffering, maybe instead we should focus on this. You could ask, what might I learn in the midst of this battle I find myself in. 
What might I learn in the midst of this battle I find myself in? So here are just some truths that I pulled right out of Scripture. It's not all inclusive. These are just some things that, that I pulled out of Scripture, of things that we could learn during our trials. One, and this is, this is me, I learned this um, in a time of, of trials, is reliance on God. Reliance on God. The truth is, however, that we're all utterly dependent on God, whether we realize it or not. See, suffering doesn't create dependence on God, but it does highlight it. God can use our sufferings to reveal to us our ultimate dependence on him and our ultimate hope in him, even in the midst of our circumstances. See, in times of suffering, we're reminded that we are naturally weak and limited in our abilities, but God alone is infinite in wisdom and in power. Afflictions, they draw us to the things of God. Because through them, we come to realize that the things of this world are utterly broken. See, nothing is as it should be. Sin has marred everything, and all of creation is groaning. Pain spurs us to search for meaning and for hope beyond our present circumstances. When life falls apart and we can no longer depend on ourselves, we learn to cling to God. See, the Apostle Paul reminds us and emphasizes the same thing through the story of his own suffering. He said, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. See, church, when despair settles in and we feel burdened beyond ourselves, reliance on God takes on a whole new meaning. And when he has rescued us from one trying situation, don't we learn to trust him more in the next? See, we can learn during our trials to trust and rely on God because we learn that God is faithful. We learn that he is able and we learn that he is always with us. The author of Hebrews encourages us this way. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. In Deuteronomy, Moses writes to God's people saying, Know therefore that the Lord your God is God, the faithful God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments to a thousand generations. Remember we sang about that last Sunday. And Paul to the church at Ephesus says, Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. You see, church, God is sovereign. He causes kingdoms to rise and fall. He causes, he reigns over nations and he reigns over circumstances. He reigns over children and spouses and marriages and jobs and churches. He reigns over Satan, and he reigns over suffering. He reigns over me, and he reigns over every single one of you. See, God who spoke the world into existence, who owns the cattle on a thousand hills, and who raises the dead is able to deliver us from any situation. And he will be with us through them all. See, we are co-heirs with Christ, church. We're sons and daughters of the Most High God. And because of this relationship, the all-powerful ruler of the universe is also the father of mercies and of all comfort. The apostle Paul said he comforts all of our afflictions. See, there's no pain or hardship that God is unaware of or distant from. Consider some more truths right from scripture about God being with us. Prophet Isaiah says, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And when you pass through the rivers, they will not sweep over you. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. The flames will not set you ablaze. The psalmist says, God is our refuge and our strength and ever-present help in trouble. Joshua, when we all know this verse, Joshua says, have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened and do not be dismayed for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. The apostle Paul to the church at Rome says, I am sure, I am certain that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things yet to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else, church, in all of creation 
will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Jesus himself, speaking of the Holy Spirit, said, I will ask the Father, and he will send you another helper to be with you forever. You know him, for he dwells with you and will be with you. See, church, during our trials, we can learn to rely on God because God is faithful, God is able, and God is always with us. Another thing, church, during our trials, we learn that suffering produces sweet fruit. Suffering produces sweet fruit. While none of us want trials to enter our life, they can be the one of the great instruments in the hands of God to mold us into his image. Though never pleasant at the time, suffering yields the sweet fruit of righteousness. Paul says in his letter to the Rome, to Rome, he says, Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God. But not only so, we also glory in our sufferings because we know suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character produces hope. See, church, Scripture promises that our suffering will never be wasted. It produces lasting endurance and character and hope. While God does not send calamity upon us merely to teach us a lesson, He does and can use our trials and our sufferings to drive us to him, to deepen our faith, to deliver us, and to mold us into the likeness of himself. So here's the thing this morning, church. If we are promised trials in our life, and we are, and through scripture we're taught that they can produce sweet fruit, the implication, I believe, is that we should be a people who are ready to, for them. We should be ready for them, right? Now, we have a lot of runners and cyclists and triathletes, even a couple Ironman competitors in our church. And on any given morning, you can see them all the way up the trail running and biking and training. Because what they all know is that they can't expect to to run a marathon or compete in a triathlon or any type of um, event without first undergoing intense training. They know they must be ready. And so, too, must we, church. We must be ready. Now, I know that we've covered a lot of scripture this morning, but if you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Peter chapter 1. just going to read this real quick. 1 Peter chapter 1. So Peter's speaking in his first letter to the church. And he says, therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope on the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. See, all throughout Peter's first letter, he calls us to have this heavenward focus. And he calls us to a sober-minded readiness when it comes to the trials that we're sure to face. See, the Christian life, it's this narrow path of suffering and sanctification. And cultivating a sober-minded readiness can help us from straying off the path when it gets especially difficult. So let's consider um, a couple practical things that we can do to be ready when trials come our way. A couple practical things. Number one, we've talked about this already this morning, is that we should expect them, right? We should expect them. Peter tells us that we should not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon us. He says it's not strange. It's not absurd. It's not meaningless. See, every time hardship enters our lives, we're reminded that this world is not yet as it should be. We're broken people living in a broken, sin-filled world. That is our current situation. The main thing, the main thing we can do, the most important thing we can do to prepare for trials is to know God's word. Know God's word ahead of time. Fight the fight of faith by meditating on and treasuring the promises of God. The sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, is the most powerful weapon that we have as believers. See, one of the clearest examples of a ready mind in Scripture 
is Jesus being tempted in the wilderness. When Satan tried to twist God's word, unlike Eve, Jesus had God's word stored up in his heart, and he had a right understanding of it, and it was a most effective weapon in his time of temptation. See, when trouble finds you, a closed Bible will yield little strength or hope for your journey. But if you're able to readily call to mind the scripture and the promises of God, the Holy Spirit can powerfully use that to help you take your stand. Another thing we can do to be prepared is pray for perseverance. Pray for perseverance. Apostle Paul in his letter to the church at Ephesus teaches them how to take a stand against the devil's schemes. He calls for them to put on the full armor of God, and he uses this powerful imagery of spiritual warfare. And in his closing remarks, he urges them, he says, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray. Another thing so important, and, and so it's so, so great to see a full church this morning, is we should be committed to a body of believers. We should be committed to a body of believers because God does not intend for us to endure suffering alone. He's given us this beautiful gift, this beautiful gift of the church. Corporate worship with the body of Christ can be a valuable means of encouragement and growth and steadfastness to spur us on. And always look for reasons to rejoice. Look for reasons to rejoice before you need reasons to rejoice, right? Keeping the sweet gifts of God's blessings ever before us can help us to maintain a right perspective when trial comes our way. And lastly, church, keep doing good. Keep doing good. See, suffering can give us what I call ingrown eyeballs, can make us self-absorbed, sometimes even make us believe that no one has it as bad as we do. But Peter urges us that even in the midst of our trial, we should stay other-focused. He says, so then, those who suffer according to God's will should commit themselves to their faithful creator and continue to do good. The Apostle Paul encourages us not to grow weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. See, one of the best weapons for getting our mind off our own suffering and troubles is to help someone else in their time of trouble and suffering. See, church, a sober-minded suffering is one that is endured with the hope of what is yet to come. And this is the pattern that we see repeatedly throughout the New Testament letters. In all their concerns about the present situation, the writers were ultimately pointing at Christ's return, at creation's renewal, and at the believer's justification. See, friends, you will never experience a struggle-free life this side of heaven. You will likely encounter trials that frustrate you, trials that keep you up at night, and even ones that plant you face down on the floor. But in each, you can take comfort in knowing that there is a God who sees, a God who cares, and a God who walks right through with you. And that all of his purposes are ultimately for our good and for his glory. See, friends, God did not make your air conditioner go out in the middle of summer to teach you a lesson. I know we've all had that happen, right? God did not make you lose your job to teach you a lesson. God did not give you cancer to teach you a lesson. He did not make your spouse cheat on you or leave you to teach you a lesson. God did not give you depression or anxiety or any other hardship to teach you a lesson. But what God did do was this. He sent his one and only son, who himself was without sin, to suffer betrayal, mocking, and flogging at the hands of his sinful accusers, then to die a brutal death nailed to a cross so that you and I who are with sin could be reconciled back to God, so that we could be rescued from an eternity apart from God and redeemed from certain eternal damnation. 
And then God raised his son up from the dead so that death, the penalty for our sin, could lose its sting and forever be defeated. And that same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, God then put inside of you and inside of me so that we can live a life filled with the fruit that the Holy Spirit produces, a life of joy and peace and love and patience and kindness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. And then God gave us the assurance of his promise that Christ is coming again. And on that day and forevermore, God's dwelling will once again be among his people. He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain because the old order of things will have passed away. Church, we have an empathetic Savior who walks with us, grieves with us, and redeems our suffering for good sometimes teaching us precious lessons through them. And knowing such, let's be prepared for the hardships. Let us rejoice in these lessons while also remembering that God's purposes in suffering are far greater than a lesson to be learned. And that one day Christ will return to save us, to heal us, and to unburden our suffering fully and forever. Would you pray with me this morning? Oh, Father God, we thank you. We thank you for your word, Lord. We thank you that your word is a light to our path, that it's a lamp to our feet. We thank you that your word is true, that it's holy, that it's life-changing, that it's alive. God, we pray that you would make us students of your word. Give us a hunger and thirst for what is true. Lord, help us to store up your word in our heart. So when the day of trouble comes, God, we will be ready to take our stand. Father, thank you that you are a God who is faithful. You are a God who is able. You are a God who is always with us. And that all of your purposes are for our good and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Can we thank Janice this morning for those awesome words she shared with us? So probably my favorite thing that she said was, um, Jesus didn't say, in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. You'll learn some really cool stuff. He said, take heart, I've overcome the world. I've overcome the world. So our hope is not in the potential of a lesson learned. Our hope is really in Jesus overcoming a broken world. And this was his plan all along. It was in the new life that he can offer his creation through his death and resurrection. And this is the hope that we can take heart in. This is how the world, a broken world, is overcome in new life, in new life. And so Jesus, on the night before he was crucified, he took bread and he gave thanks to God. And he broke it and he said that this was his body, which is going to be broken for us. And then he took a cup of wine and he said the wine represented his blood that was going to be shed for us for the forgiveness of our sins. And that through all of this, we might die to our sin and be raised with him. That our broken selves would die and be raised with him. We would be a part of that redeemed creation. Maybe we would get some personal lessons along the way, but ultimately we would be a part of a redeemed creation. And if you just have to find that personal significance, if you have to have something to grab onto through your sufferings, then here's what can happen. It can drive you to this table. It can drive you to the new life that Jesus offers you. It can drive you to what Janice mentioned, that reliance 
on God and that dependence on his hope for our creation. So would you pray with me this morning? God, I lift up these these everyday elements of bread and juice to you. Holy Spirit, I pray that you would make them be for us your body and your blood so that we could be redeemed by you and sent into your world to bring that hope of a new creation, that hope of a redeemed world, that things would be broken no longer. So Holy Spirit, would you come upon us this morning and may we receive confirmation, assurance over and over and over again of new life that you give us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to invite those who are helping to serve to go ahead and come forward. And as they do that, I'll just kind of give you some instructions. One is that communion is open for anyone. If you are open to what God might do in your life through communion, then communion is for you this morning. Uh, Two is that uh, the ushers will kind of pass communion down through the aisles. You'll just take a piece of bread. You'll dip it in the cup. Uh, As Corky says, we're not going to drink from the cup. It's going to freak your neighbor out a little bit. Um, You're going to dip a piece of bread in the cup, and that's how we're going to receive communion this morning. Uh, And it'll just kind of go row by row. If you would like gluten-free communion or otherwise just want to pre-package communion for any reason, uh, raise your hand, and I'll be looking for you, and I'll bring that straight to you. So uh, ushers, go ahead and serve us this morning.
highlands and the heartache all the same. Church, indeed, he is no less God in the shadows, no less faithful when the night leads us astray. Jesus Christ has overcome the world and he promises he is coming again. And when he does, he will make all things new. I wanna send you off this morning with this word of encouragement from the word. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Go church in peace and joy because you can know that you can. Amen. Love you. <laughs>